before I start the lecture, um, I just want to ask if you have any comments about the last lecture, any questions, um, any change you would like to see in the way I deliver the lecture. Um, you don't have to give me your feedback right now in the spot. Just think about these questions. And those who know me, um, they know that I'm very open with the feedback. And I do listen to what students ask me to do. So um, if there is any change you wish to see in the way I deliver the lecture, please come and tell me. Send me an email, uh, or you can just just tell, let me know in any way you prefer. Um, in this lecture, uh, we will move to the next topic. But what I usually do in my lectures, um, I like to go back to do a quick, a quick recap to what I have covered in the previous week. And that's the case with all my lectures. So I always start with what I have covered last week, and I show you how the um, new topic, which we'll cover today, is linked to what we have uh, covered in the previous week. So, oops. as you see, uh, we have a few topics to cover from lecture 6 to lecture 10, so that's the end of the semester. We already covered the first topic, which is in green, and these are the rest of the topics. And today we will talk about regression with qualitative variables, and I'll explain what that means. But just to let you know, now this is the second, lecture, uh, the second topic, and then we'll have two more lectures to, uh, to the end of the semester, and then one lecture to do a kind of revision and talk about how to do a, an empirical research project. So, as I said, um, I find it very useful to just uh, give a quick recap of what we discussed in the previous week. Um, we also did a recap of regression model and what we uh, include in a regression model and the general uh, uh, model, how it looks like. We have a dependent variable. We call it Y. You can call it whatever you want, but this is by convention, like now, uh, we call it Y. It's just a dependent variable. It's the variable that we would like to uh, study or explain. And on the right-hand side, we have a number of variables that we believe they are important in explaining the variation or the behavior of the dependent variable. So those variables on the right-hand side, Xs, or the regressors, or the explanatory variables, and what variables to include? So we should include the most important variables. Um, and then what remains will be the errors. Okay. So anything that is not explicitly included in the model is not one of your x's, is not one of your regressors. That means will be captured, the effect of this variable that is not in the model will be captured by the error term. Okay, so the error term is there to represent all those variables that are not explicitly mentioned in, the, in your model. Again, when I say a model, <coughs> I'm talking about the simplest form here, which is one equation model. Maybe next year, if you do econometrics, you will, have, uh, you will talk about different uh, types of models where you could have uh, more than one equation in your model. But now, for now, we talk about only one equation model or a single equation model where we have um, a dependent variable that is explained by a number of independent variables or uh, uh, regressors. And as we said, these should be the most important variables and then what remains will be, in, will be captured by the error term. Our task is to estimate the coefficients, betas, okay? And because we can't do this, we can't study the population, we, we draw a sample and then we collect data from this sample, for a sample. And then we use our magical technique, O less, ordinary least squares, and we know what ordinary least squares does, okay? So it basically minimizes this sum that you see, so the, um, the squared errors. 
and you already learned how to drive the uh, uh, formula, how to um, get the value of beta or beta hat uh, using this. So you, you take the first derivative, you make it equal zero, and uh, you get the uh, beta hat, or beta one or beta zero hat. So just one more thing to, to highlight again. Regression doesn't mean causality. So if you want to establish causality between X and Y, this has to be from, do you remember? Where does this come from? So, if I, so regression is not causality, okay? Re causality usually is established based on theory, not on regression, okay? So anyway, so this is something we discussed last week. We made some assumptions about our model, and we said, okay, we put some assumptions about how we would like our mo model to behave, so this is the ideal scenario, okay? And in most cases, these assumptions are not true, okay? So we need to test for these assumptions. So what, what assumptions we made here? Uh, we made assumption from one to seven. Um, we, made the, we, we assumed that um, with all this, we, we said actually this is one of the points that we covered last lecture, that all this, it's important for all this to, uh, if you want to use all this, it's important to have uh, a linear and parameter uh, uh, model. The regressors are fixed or non-stochastic. The expected value of your errors given the x's or your regressors should be zero. Assumption four, the uh, errors are homoscedastic, and I think this next lecture we'll talk about this point. Homoscedastic errors means that uh, that error that has constant variance, okay? So which we usually call it sigma square. We will talk about this next lecture. No autocorrelation. The lecture after that will talk about correlation. So the covariance, or there is no correlation between the errors. Um, at any point or between two different observations. No multicollinearity, so there's no re, um, linear collinearity or uh, relationship between x's and uh, one x and another x, so between x's or your, uh, your, your independent variables. And then no specification bias, one of which, one case of which we talked about last week was the uh, functional form, okay? So the specification bias include other stuff as well, which again we will, we will cover I think in two weeks' time. So if all these assumptions, the ideal situation of this happen, that these assumptions are true, then our OLS, our lovely estimator, is called blue. Okay? So what does blue mean? Can anyone tell me? Yes, <laughs> best linear unbiased estimator, okay? So what do you mean by linear? We understand it's linear and parameter, we explained that, okay? That the whole lecture last, uh, was part of the lecture last week was about the, the, to how to differentiate between linear and parameter and linear and variables, and what we care about with all this that we have a linear and parameter uh, uh, model. Um, well, how about unbiased? What do you mean by unbiased estimator? I can't hear you, sorry. Okay, let's, let's have some, someone to try from this side. Yes. So, so the expected value of your estimator should equal the true parameter beta. So the expected value of beta hat, okay, that should be beta. And we explained that last time, very quickly or very briefly, I did, I explained that. So when you draw a sample, use all this, you get an estimation, you draw another sample, then you get slightly different number for that beta uh, hat. And then if you do that many, many times, and then on average, you should approach, you should be very close to the true parameter beta, okay? And that is in words or in English, how to explain the expected value of your beta hat equal beta, okay? So that's one thing, okay, how about Best. What do you mean by best? 
So which means efficiency in this context. Or yes, so we have, if we have to choose between a number of unbiased estimators, so in first place, they're all unbiased. So if you have estimator one, estimator two, estimator three, or if you have beta, theta, gamma, whatever, call them whatever you want. If you have three estimators and three of them, all of them are unbiased, then which one we would choose is the best or which one is the best is the one that has minimum variance. Okay, so it's very important to understand what that means. Okay, so best here means uh, the estimator with minimum variance. Okay, so that's what blue means. So blue, best, linear, unbiased. Okay, so unbiased, the expected value of your estimator equal the true parameter beta, the uh, best means the one that has the minimum variance, linear in parameter we already explained last time, uh, that is not raised to any power, or is not, so it's very the, the simplest form uh, uh, as we explained last time. So every time we talk about, in, 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 in this lecture, in the, in, the, in the last lecture, sorry, and, and the, the next new, uh, Two lectures, we will be talking about how to test for these assumptions, whether they are valid, okay? So what if they are not valid? How to actually, or what are the consequences? Uh, how those uh, 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 will affect our earliest estimators, etc. So then, so we explained the idea of linear and parameter and linear and variable. I said, as we said, OLS deals with uh, linear parameters models. So that means if you have, um, a model that is not linear in parameter, that is, is, uh, is nonlinear, like a quadratic function or in log form, we still can use OLS, but given that the betas are just betas, so they, they're not raised to any power, and they, 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 they are in the simplest form, uh, the linear form. And then um, moving from this form where we have a linear model, even linear in variables as well, we, in this case, you can explain beta hat or you interpret beta uh, hat one as the, we call it the slope coefficient and the way we interpret it is when x changed by y uni unit, because x and y in this, in this situation, in this example, are measured by units. So if, if x is changed by one unit, how much y will it change? Exactly, beta one units again. So it's units again, it's units because x and y are measured in units. But this, is, this doesn't have to be the case because in some situation you actually have a model that is not linear in variables, it's still linear in parameters, which means that you still can use OLS to estimate this model, but you're, you, you have a log form or you have a quadratic uh, uh, term in your, in, your, in your model, then the interpretation of betas here is slightly different and you need to, uh, to be aware of this. You need to be able to, to interpret a model where your x and y are not uh, linear. So the first case we looked at when we have log log uh, model, so that means we have log y equal beta zero, uh, beta one log uh, x. So you have log in both sides and that that is one of the most, like, uh, that's very uh, 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 easy to interpret model, and that's why economists usually prefer this sort of models, and we call it elasticity, because elasticity is the person change, again, is the person change. So in our case here, if, um, so if, if, if X increase by 1%, then Y will change by, Exactly, so beta percent. So in that case, it's percent change, again, it's percent change, and that's, that's the elasticity. That's what elasticity means, okay? So it's very straightforward, and that regardless, one of the advantages of having this, you don't really have to worry about the uh, measurement of your uh, variables. So the way you measure, or the units, or how you measure X and how you measure Y doesn't really uh, uh, make any issue. Now, it doesn't cause any issue for the interpretation now, because at the end of the day, all what you're saying here is one person change in X will lead to uh, beta hat person change in Y. Okay, so it's person change against person change and I don't have anything to worry about in terms of measuring this, uh, how the units or how I measured both variables it, because it, it measured person change basically, not units. Then the second case we talked about is log lin. So again, what I, what, I, what I want from this is that how to interpret beta. Okay, so in this case, okay, so we said if one unit increase in X, 
okay? That will lead to 100 times B. By the way, B here, I wrote B small just to make it different from beta, the true parameter. So this is the estimator, okay? So you could have written this as beta hat. So it's the same. So B small is the same as beta hat. Beta hat is the estimator. B small, I mean the estimator as well. So um, that's, that's 100 times B percent change in, in Y, and that's an approximation of this change. Uh, similarly, when you look at lin log model, so in that case, your Y is without, a, without log, and the log actually is on the right-hand side. So you have Y against log X. So in that case, um, so that means a 1% change in, in X. So in that case, the change in X is not in unit because X is in log. So that means 1% change in log, uh, sorry, in X. Uh, that will lead to uh, change Y by B, which again is beta hat divided by 100. And this is again an approximation of this. Then we talked about the inverse model. When you have Y equal beta 0 plus beta 1, but now it's not X, it's actually 1 over X. So 1 divided by X. So in that case, we said, okay, so the slope, in that case, dy dx, or the slope, that, that's what we want to know, is the slope. So every time here, we're actually trying to interpret beta, which is the slope coefficient. So in that case, the slope here will be minus beta 2 times 1 over X squared. And just again to, uh, to repeat this, this, is, this should be beta hat because I don't know beta. I don't have, I don't have beta. So this, I should have written here beta hat. Um, the quadratic function, so when you have x squared in your model, uh, um, the slope will be beta 1 plus 2 beta 2x. So, and, and, and we show how to, um, to calculate the turning point, and we explain with the quadratic function, your, your, your function will look like uh, either a U shape or an inverse U shape. Uh, uh, so that's how it looks like. So it's not a straight line, like a linear function, a quadratic function. So when you plot a quadratic function, it looks like something like this, okay? So anyway, so basically this is the takeaway message from last week. So if you understand everything I said now, so that means you understood everything uh, about the last lecture. Okay, so that's kind of the takeaway message uh, from, from last week. And I, and I hope if you have any questions, please raise your hand or you can ask me after the lecture. Okay, any question about last lecture? Okay. So just to let you know, for those who didn't notice, the lecture was on Hanomics, my YouTube channel, um, on the same day of the lecture. So after the lecture, I uploaded the, the, the recording. And if you don't know how to get there, just click, just click on that click here. That will take you straight to, to, the, uh, to the lecture. And I'm recording this now, and hopefully I'll be able to upload it again uh, on Hanomics. Okay, so now moving to what we want to cover today. So that was just a recap of what we covered last week. Um, today, I want to talk about qualitative variables. Um, so some var variables that cannot be measured in uh, units. You can't have a, a quantitative measure of these such, of such variables. And these can be either on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side. So it could be your dependent variable or your x, one of your x's, okay? So we'll start with the first case, and then we'll move to the second case. So we'll start with, when, with the case that where we have qualitative variables in the right-hand side first, okay? Which we'll call dummy variables. So just to explain the idea, as I said, sometimes you have information that you think that are important to be considered in your model. And you remember we agreed that we would love to have this sort of information or these factors on explicitly in the model, and that's what makes a good model, okay? So you pick in from the error term, you pick in all the important effect or influences, and you explicitly considering this into your model, okay? If you don't take this into consideration, then the effect goes in your, in your errors, and that, is, that means you, 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 your model is not, is not the best model that you could, uh, you could estimate. 
So in that case, I said some of these variables, some of these influences are not really quantitative. They cannot be measured in quantitative sense, but still they are important to, uh, to the model. Some examples here could be gender, when we talk about determining wage level. So uh, there could be some systematic differences between uh, male and females, okay? And this is something that we should consider in our model. So gender could be something important. Ethnicity could be something important, maybe when, uh, when, when you also consider a, a, a wage equation, then ethnicity could be uh, important. There could be some sort of discrimination against some minority, and you really want to pick this up in your model. Or it could be in a consumption function, and you want to, you, you believe that different ethnic groups may follow different consumption patterns, and you really, because you, you want to model consumption, you want to pick up these differences. Okay? So in that case, gender is not a quantitative variable, it's just some qualitative information telling me that that person I'm collecting the information from is a male or a female or belong to whatever uh, ethnic group, okay? So um, educational level, okay, again, so you want, maybe you want, if you want to uh, 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 model earnings from uh, employment, or if you have a wage equation, you want to say, okay, education is one of the important factors that determine how much you would earn after you graduate or after joining the labor market, and then how, I'm going, how am I going to include this into the model? So if I want to compare someone with, let's say, um, a bachelor degree or undergrad degree with somebody with a PhD or with a, a master's degree, okay? So how am I going to do that, okay? Again, this is something, um, sort of the qual qualitative information that you might think or might be important to, to your model. So the idea here is that we need to think of a way to actually include this into our, uh, our model. So in that case, as I said, you could include what we call a dummy variable. Uh, a dummy variable here as a regressor, so we said this is the first case. We'll start with um, modeling these qualitative variables as one of the regressors, so they appear on the right-hand side. And this could be called dummy variables, but also it has other names, indicator variables, categor categorical variables, or qualitative variables, okay? But it's, it's very common to call it dummy variable. So it's a kind of a nominal scale variable um, that have no particular numerical value. So it could be so in our case, when we talk about gender, we could say we could give male any value, we could give female another value just to identify, or just to say these two are different in terms of gender. So they, this is a female, this is a male. So just to, for sort of identifying these differences. But again, it doesn't mean anything, that number. So if I give it any value, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Okay? So if I say a male equal two and a female equal one, it doesn't mean that male should be more than, should be greater than, than, than female, it, because two is greater than one. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything, okay? To pay, so if you put it the other way around, again, it's not gonna change anything in your model. It's just to identify these two individuals or the di different groups. Um, usually you use this in uh, cross-sectional settings. Do you remember what do we mean by cross-sections? So cross-section data. Do you remember? We talked about this last week. Were you here last week? Do you remember? Yeah, we talked about this last week. So what, what, what do you mean by cross-section data? Yes, thank you. <laughs> so you collect data for a, a number of units, okay, in one point in time. So there's no change in time. Okay, so you have different units. Compare this to time series, so it's only one unit, so it's not a number of units, but over time. So it's one unit over time, that's time series. Panel data when you have both dimension in your data. So as I said here, usually uh, this sort of um, qualitative information are included in uh, cross-sectional, but this doesn't mean that they cannot be used with time series as well. They actually they can be used in 
uh, in time series. And I'm including here some examples of how you, would, uh, how you may include these sort of qualitative informations or dummy variables in a time series uh, setting. Maybe you want to study the changes in political regime, how this affect production, okay, or employment or any other macro variable, okay. You want to study what if um, labor in the UK um, took over from the Conservative Party. Is there any change when you look at the past, okay, between these two, uh, two different uh, parties? So again, you could just, again, you could use dummy variable to identify these two, two time periods. Um, you, could you could use uh, uh, a dummy variable to pick up any uh, maybe a kind of common trend or common uh, effect of, let's say, war or significant events like war or global financial crisis uh, on some, again, ec economic activities or any macroeconomic variables. So when you, you include that, you just try to pick up any change that happened before and after uh, this, this event. And, and so on. So you can actually uh, do this to study, again, seasonality. If you think, or say, sales um, change across uh, different quarters in the year. So in, in Christmas time, sales uh, increase significantly because of the season or the uh, uh, Every, every Christmas you will have this increase in, 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 in sales and that's why maybe you need to include a dummy variable to identify this effect or this sort of seasonality in your, um, in your, uh, in your regression. So the, the bottom line here is okay, so it can actually, so you could use dummy variables. It's very common in cross-section, uh, cross-sectional uh, uh, data or studies, but also can be used in time series settings as well. So let's now um, think of an example. How can we use a dummy variable or how can we use this sort of qualitative information in our model? So let's say, let's, um, say we want to model a uh, wage, okay? And we believe that the gender is one of the important determinants of wage level or the hourly rate. So in that case, our um, dependent variable will be wage, how much uh, 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 the individuals in your data set receive per, uh, per, per hour, or hourly weight, or per week, or whatever. And then on the right hand side, we could have education. We believe, let's say, education and is, a, is an important determinant of, of wage. And in that sense, we'll say we're not going to model education as a qualitative variable here. We'll just say we're just going to include the number of years of education. So we're not actually comparing between different levels. So this is not the qualitative sort of qualitative variable I want to model here. But the qualitative variable I want to model here is, the, is gender. Okay? So what if I want to say, okay, is there any differences? Are there any differences between male and female? So the same, uh, let's say, uh, two individuals that have the same level of education or the same number of years of education, would they earn differently based on their gender? Okay, whether they are male or female. So this is the sort of qualitative uh, information I'm talking about here. So I have two groups, male and female. You could include that or you could define these groups. Let's say I'm going to give um, male zero and female one. And again, these two values don't mean anything, okay? So if, if you change it to one and two, or if you uh, put it the other way around, so if you define it that female equals zero and male equal one, that shouldn't change anything, okay? So again, this is the sort of, uh, uh, as we said, uh, the, the, this is not the numerical value, it's actually more about just identifying two groups, okay? Or the, the two groups we have in this example. So, um, which group is assigned the value, the value of one shouldn't alter your results. You should get the same results, regardless of how you define both uh, uh, groups. But in this example, let's just say, and as I said, you could use any number, one, zero, or one and two, but the easiest way for the interpretation really is zero and one, okay? It's just very straightforward to understand as well, as you will see now. 
So let's now say we have two groups, female and males, and we want to include this information in our model, so we define it as uh, this way. So we define it as female equal one, male equal, uh, 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 equal zero. And in this case, zero here, or the group that will uh, be assigned zero, this group will be called your reference group or comparison group uh, or, uh, or benchmark group, uh, etc., or control group. Okay, so it can be called any of these, but at the end of the day, it's the group that you compare with. Okay, so if male zero, that means I'm compare female compared to male. So male is my reference group. So let's see this in an equation. How how that uh, how how would we include this in an equation? So an equation now we adding this information or including this information into our model. Um, result in this sort of, uh, of, of model here where we have, again, wage is the variable that we want to explain. We believe that wage level determine or depend on uh, education, but also we, 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 we think that uh, uh, gender is important and we included one dummy variable which we call d, i here, and the coefficient here associated or attached to this d, i is delta zero. Of course, plus some, uh, some errors. So let's now think of this scenario now. So if we have, just think of this as, look, we got two equations or two, two lines here. So one for male and one, one for female. Because if D equals zero, then this term will disappear as zero, okay? Then the equation that we left with is going to be this X here is education. I should have actually written this education. So we'll have only a, 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 a Y or wage equal beta naught plus beta one. Um, so this one should be education. And this one should be wage. Okay? So the, the second equation for female or the second line for females is going to be if this equal one, okay, then one times delta zero is one. That means we have the intercept, or we've got a new intercept here, which is beta zero plus delta uh, zero, okay? And just to see what I mean here by two different intercepts, so we have these two lines. So the first line, okay, it depends, of course, on which one above the other will depend on the value of delta here, okay? So if delta is positive, that means, remember, how did we define D? D here equal one for G, the dummy variable, equal one for female, okay? So if delta is zero, that means female earn more than male who have the same level of education but if that equal uh, uh, if, if it has a negative sign that means female earn less compared to so we always compare with we always compare with male or with the reference group our reference group here is males because why it, why is it male why is the reference group is male here exactly because we give it zero okay so it's, this is very important. Listen, if you do it the other way, if I give female zero and male one, then my reference group will be female. So I'll be comparing with female. But because in this example here, my reference group is uh, male, I give it zero. So this is my reference group. Then the coefficient I have here, del delta zero, is again, is the difference between female and male. So if that coefficient is positive, that means female earn more than, on average, men more than male, okay, given the same level of education. So remember, the same number of years of education. So if we have two people, two individuals, okay, with the same number uh, uh, of years of education, okay, but they are different in gender, then how much one will earn more than the other, or whether female will earn more than, man, than male, will depend really, more or less than male, will depend really on the sign of this delta zero. 
So if it's positive, that means that I earn more compared to uh, males, compared to my reference group. If it is negative, that means they earn less than uh, my reference group. And this is exactly what exactly this, this line here is saying. So assuming that uh, delta zero is negative, so if you assume that this one is uh, negative, Okay, so that means this line here, which is the new, the new intercept or the intercept for females, which equal beta naught plus delta naught here, which is obviously it's below this line. Okay, so that means this is how much this difference, this is how much they, they earn less than, than, uh, than males. So at any level here of education, okay, so for any given level of education here, if you go up this way, then the point here on this line will tell you how much on average a woman with this, this level of education or this number of years of education will earn. And then going farther up here on this line will show you how much uh, the, in, that individual who, who is male, but with the same number of, of uh, uh, years of education, how much they will, they will earn. So the difference between these two, the difference between these two is is that value of delta, if what you estimate for delta zero. Okay, we'll see an example now, so don't worry if you, if you haven't uh, got uh, the idea. But again, just to, to simplify things, so our delta here, delta zero, is basically the difference between how much uh, a male, or how much a female, sorry, will earn, okay, compared to a male, so this is the difference between what she earned and what a male would earn, given that both have the same level of education or the same number of years of education. Because education here we define as number of years, it's not levels, okay? So in that case, if there, are any, if there is any sort of discrimination because of gender, it should be picked up with the, uh, uh, by this sort of uh, uh, dummy variable. Because what we would expect here we would expect that um, an individual with a, a certain or given number of education, a number of years of education, they should earn the same. Whether it doesn't matter whether they are a female or or a male, if if education is the most or the only uh, determinant of of wage, because obviously there are other determinants. But we're just trying to simplify the case. I'm trying to give just a, a very naive example, uh, just looking at education. But of course, experience matters, like other, there are other factors that we could include. And then we'll see if that delta is, is significantly uh, different from zero or not. So again, we could do that uh, using the usual uh, uh, T-test. Uh, test. But anyway, so, um, so in this case, again, I'm just trying to generalize this. And just um, actually written the same, not this one. So we, we, we have this line now. Now just trying to, to talk about how many variables to include. So remember we had two groups, male and female. So males and females. How many dummy variables we included? So we have two groups. How many dummy variables we included? One. Okay. So this is going to be your rule of thumb. Okay. So always include the number of groups minus one. Why Why need to always include the number of groups minus one? So num this is the number of dummies to include. The number of dummies to include is the number of groups minus one. So I have number of groups here, two, then I include only one. So if I had three groups, then I include two. If I have four groups, like four seasons, I include three dummies. If I have 12 months, so I want dummies for month, so then I include 11 dummies. So it's always G minus one. It's always number of groups minus one. Why? What, what happened to that one? Why am I omitting this one? Because this is, this is my reference group. This is the group I compare with, okay? So you always need to, and this is um, important to not fall in what we call the dummy variable trap. So what is the dummy variable trap? The dummy variable trap is if you have a constant in your model, which is beta naught in this, uh, in our example, 
then you should include g minus 1. Otherwise, you will fall in a multicollinearity problem. You remember one of the assumptions that we made about our OLS, about our model, sorry, that there is no multicollinearity. Okay, there is no uh, uh, correlation or uh, your x's are not collinear or there's no linear relationship between your x's. Okay, so having a constant or having intercept and including g, so in our example, if you include two dummies, one for, one for male and one for female, this is going to be uh, a typical case of uh, perfect multicollinearity. Again, so this is something very important. So if you have two groups, then you include only one, of course, plus your, uh, your intercept. And again, the omitted group, sorry. So the omitted group is, is your reference group, is the group that I'm comparing with. So um, <coughs> if, you <coughs> if you didn't include an intercept, then that should, shouldn't be a problem because that case you're not falling in a dummy variable trap, you don't have perfect multicollinearity. Okay, so again, yes. Okay, perfect. We, we will have a lecture, a full lecture about multicollinearity, but for now, let's just think about it this way, okay? So when you have a constant or an intercept, what, how do we interpret the intercept in general in any, in any econometric model? So when you have y equal beta naught plus beta one x one plus an error term. So when we look at this beta naught, actually we say, okay, this is actually the value of your dependent variable in average if your x equals zero, okay? So if we include, so in, in our case here, when we include only one dummy, so again, if that dummy equals zero, is your reference group, is that right? Exactly, so in that case, your intercept will be will be exactly the, 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 dependent the, the value of your dependent variable in average for that reference group, which is the males. But if I include, if I include two groups, that means you're doing that twice, okay? And that's what we call perfect multicollinearity. And actually most softwares will actually give you an error message. It's not going to, interpret, it's not going to even estimate that so sort of model. Okay, so if you do that in views, it shouldn't, you, you wouldn't get any estimation because this is what we call perfect multicollinearity. So kind of you, you actually include that twice in your model. But if you drop your constant, if you drop your intercept, in that case, your dummy that represents the zero or your reference group becomes, your, becomes that, the new intercept. Okay, so as a rule of thumb, so if you have an intercept in your model, if you have a constant in your model, the beta naught, then you should include g minus one. So the number, the number of dummies in your model should equal g is the number of groups minus one. So if you have two groups, then you include one dummy. If you have four groups, then you include three dummies. If you have 12 groups, then you include 11 uh, dummies. So it's all g minus one. Given that you have a constant in your, in your, um, in your regression, in your equation. So if you don't have a constant, that shouldn't, make any co that shouldn't cause any problem if you include g, the number of dummies equal g, okay? Um, as we said before, the interpretation of your coefficient will be always explained in terms of or co compared with or related to your reference group. So it's very important when you, um, when you, when you, when you um, run any regression to make sure that you understand with dummy variables, to make sure you understand how your dummies are defined. Because I'm going to always compare with uh, the reference group. So let's, uh, <coughs> sorry, let's have an example. So for example, this data, uh, again, is a very uh, simple example, talking about, okay, we were trying to model uh, 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 hourly wage in dollars, and we have a number of factors here. We actually have a number of dummies as well, not just only one dummy. So, um, but, but everyone, every one, one of these dummies, each one of these dummies represent again uh, different uh, uh, groups. So, for example, female, it's coded one for female, zero for male. Okay, um, non-white, this again represent race, which is 
coded one for non-white and zero for uh, for white. Union, it's again, it's another dummy variable, so it means zero if you're not a member in a union, one if you are a member in a, a, a union. Education is education in years, so number of, of years of education. Uh, experience, again, it's the uh, work experience in years. Uh, this one, this table, sorry. Okay, so this here, the estimation of this sort of model. So wage is my dependent variable. So let's say now look at this coefficient that is attached to female. What does this minus 3.07 mean? So remember, how did we define female here? The first thing to ask yourself is, what is my reference group? Which group I'm comparing with? So in that case, it's obvious when you call it female, so that your, your reference group is, is male. And that's actually something I do prefer when you use dummy variables. It's, it's always easier to use some, uh, to name your variable in, in a way that you would, is, would be very easy to understand. So if I call this gender, if I call the dummy variable gender, it would be very confusing. Does gender mean one male or one female? So, I, but if I call it ma female, it's very obvious. So it's one e equal one if it's female, and then my omitted group is the male. So I'm actually com is the male. So I'm I'm comparing with males. Okay. So in this case, given that the sign of this coefficient is minus three point zero seven, what does that mean? So comparing with males, so if we have an individual with the same, all of these characteristics are the same, so we, we're holding these other variables not changing so that they are the same, so have the same level of experience, the same level of education, and everything else equal, okay, except their gender, except they are not, uh, 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 f the, whether they are female or male, that means a female will earn less than Male, this is my comparison group. Okay, by how much? By three dollars. Three point zero blah 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 dollars dollars. Because remember, wage here is measured by dollars, is measured in dollars. So that means a female with the same characteristic will usually earn less than a male, again with the same characteristic, but by how much? According to this example, by three dollars. Uh, so they, they will earn always three dollars less, even if they have the same characteristic, the same level of experience, the same level of education. If they are members in union, if they are, so if they agree, if they have all these characteristics, the same matching, except that's just their gender. Then so you, you remember we did the same when we interpret any other coefficient. When we interpret any other stop coefficient, we always assume that other variables are constant. We don't really change them. Okay, so we look only at one. Uh, 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 one coefficient at a time, so we assume that other variables are not going to change. But anyway, is this clear? How do you, how would you interpret this dummy, uh, this estimated coefficient for the dummy? This is our delta zero here, or call it whatever you want. Is this clear? Yes. 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 So when I when I look at the non-white, for example, again. So when I interpret that minus 1.56, okay? So I'm comparing this with, what is my reference group? White, exactly. So always remember, who is your reference group? You need to know that, okay? And white here is coded as zero. So non-white is one, white is zero. So I'm always comparing with the reference group. So in, in that case, this minus 1.56, that means um, a person or an individual or two individuals with the same characteristics, okay, and they will earn, um, an unwhite person will earn less by uh, 1.56 than a white person with the same characteristic, okay? Again, according to this example, so it seems like less. And if you, if you look at the probability value, the p-value, is very small p-value, that means this, so this seems to be statistically significant as well, okay? Is that clear? You want a break?
Okay. Six minutes break. Seven minutes. Okay, I'll be generous, more generous. <laughs> so what we, um, what we covered so far was very simple. It's just how to define a dummy variable. If you have two groups, like gender, you have female and male, you can use or you include uh, one dummy. So in our example, we want to model uh, wage, and we thought that gender is important, one of, one, an important determinant of, of wage. So we included a dummy, which we defined as, we call the female, and we defined as equal one if we have a female, um, and equal zero if the individual is a male. So if female equals zero, if we have a male, so that means this equals zero, and that means the whole term will equal zero. That means what we have actually, or beta zero here is, this is on average how much uh, uh, a male can, uh, can earn, or the, on the average wage for, uh, for males. So this is how to interpret beta naught in this case. Okay, just remember wage here is linear, so we don't have any log, li log wage uh, yet. So we will look at how would we interpret that if, we, if wage was uh, in log form. So that's, if, so that's the case with, with uh, a male. But if, if we have the individual is a female, so that means this will equal one. And now we will have a new intercept which equal these two, beta naught and plus beta uh, beta 1, and depending on the sign of beta 1, that will tell you whether female earn more or less than a male, and by how much. Okay? So depending on the sign of beta 1. So if beta 1 is positive, that means a female with the same characteristic will earn that, uh, a female will earn more, more than uh, a male with the same characteristic. If, the, if beta 1 equal, uh, greater than 0 or, or positive. If beta 1 was negative, then that means, again, female earn less than a male with the same characteristic. So that's why, so this is just a general, in general, how much females would earn uh, on, on average in this model. So it depend on the, depends on the, the, the sign of beta 1. So how about if we have, rather than wage, we all know that um, li a log wage is more uh, common than, than wage. Again, it's just the way uh, wage variable is usually distributed. So to make it no, uh, closer to a normal distribution, we usually use the log wage. So most of the uh, papers that you would read that try to model wage, so you probably will have log wage on the right, on the on the left hand side. It's not wage; it's going to be the log wage. So how would we interpret this? Or beta one and beta two the same in in, in this case? So in this case, um, if you want to know again, so this the log wage. Let's say let's think of a of a male. So thinking of a a male. So that means this equal. If we have a male, that means this will equal zero. Okay. So what does this tell us? It tells us that. So this is our comparison group. It tells us that the lin wage or the log of wage for males is equal beta one. But I don't want the log of wage. I actually want the wage, how much on average they earn. So to know how much on average they earn, so you need to get the exponential of this beta uh, beta one. Okay, so if you want to know how much, again, if that person was a female, if that individual was a female, so that means this would equal one, and now we will have log, or the, the length of wage, or the natural log of wage, equal beta one plus beta two. So again, beta one and beta two here, beta one plus beta two here is not wage, it's the log of wage. So how, how can I get this as wage, then again, you just need to get the exponential of that. So it's, it's uh, 
beta 1 plus beta 2. So that will give you how much females earn in, uh, compared to two males. And that will give you the average earning of, of females in your sample. So what I did here is exactly the same in this example. When I, this is the distribution of wage. And as I told you, um, in general, or is very common that you'll see that we usually use the log of wage because it changed that to more a closer distribution to the normal distribution which we prefer. So in this, in this estimation here, so it's the same way. So if you really want to know now, so again, we, we have the same sign, it is negative. So that means a female would earn less on average than a male with the same characteristic. But 0.24 here, which is the beta one, Okay, to know how much, this is the log of wage. So this is, so it's not wage. So if I want to know how much a female would earn uh, differently compared to uh, a, 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 a male, then you need to get the exponent of this plus the uh, beta zero here, which is C. C here is the minus 0 0.9055. Uh, so you just follow this rule. Okay, so that's the, that is the difference when you have a uh, log uh, wage or log in the dependent variable. That's how we do how you would interpret this beta and you would interpret this beta too. So in the linear case, which is the simplest, the most straightforward case, so that shouldn't be a problem because if we have a male, that means uh, this equals zero. And that means this beta note here actually represent how much males in your sample would earn on average, okay? which will be beta naught, will be your, your intercept. And beta zero plus beta one, these two, if we have a female, that will equal one, and that means these two represent, on average, how much females uh, receive or earn in your, in your sample, okay? And beta one, depending on the sign of beta one, as we explained, this will tell you whether female earn more or less than a male, depending on this, uh, the sign of this coefficient beta one. Is that clear? Okay, I hope so. Anyway, so you could just one, one more thing to, before we conclude this part, just to move to the other case when we have the dummy variable on the left-hand side, not on the right-hand side. So we've been talking so far that what if we have the dummy variable or the qualitative information that we want to include in our model in the, in the right-hand side. So there's another case where what if I want to see the interaction between these two dummies, meaning if, what if I want to see how much um, education will affect a female or um, um, the earning or the wage level for a female. So you can get actually the interaction between both variables. So in that case, uh, what if I want like a female and non-white female? So not, ju not just, I'm not just comparing female uh, with with male, I'm not just comparing non-white with white. I actually, inter I'm interested actually in uh, a more, more than that. I'm interested in a, a non-white female, for example, okay? Or how much education or the retained education for females. So I actually want the interaction between uh, two uh, two uh, uh, two dummies. So in that case, you could actually um, define this sort of interaction as you see. So what these dummies tell us, this interaction term here, female. Can you see that? female uh, non-white, sorry. So that means, again, you, you multiply female by uh, this dummy, these two dummies together, or the, what we call the interaction between both. And that will tell you, again, so what does that mean? This coefficient means it compares those female non-white with your reference group here will be anybody else who's not female and non-white. Okay? So, um, and, and so on. So you could, you could do that. You could also do like um, a female times education and it will give you again, so how much the education, an extra year of education will, me will mean for the um, wage of a female, okay? So um, this is something you could, you could also do, which I actually, um, I added more, more dummies here and I did estimate the model again. So anyway, so this is the log. So now, so far we've been talking about one case, or as we said in the beginning, the qualitative information that we, we, we want to model, we wish to model, could be X, could be one of our X's, could be in the right-hand side as a regressor, 
or it could be on the left hand side so it could be it could be yes or no something that happened or didn't happen and you want to actually model that as you will see now the example i will include um what if i want to see what determines whether a person is smoker or not so your dependent variable or the variable that you want to explain here is the smoking behavior yes or no so you just model a variable that y your y variable takes only two variable uh, values zero if a person is not smoker one if the person is smoker so this sort of variable also this sort of uh, a model here okay is 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 different or the way we we interpret the coefficient here is slightly different from what we learned so far okay but just to make things clear now so the whole lecture today about qualitative variables qualitative variables the variables that we cannot measure so we give it some uh, values and these values don't mean anything so again just i need to highlight that again so giving female one and male zero doesn't mean anything so if you put the other way around you should get the same uh, the same results shouldn't shouldn't change your results so but the, the the case that we dealt with so far we try to explain is when we have our qualitative variables modeled among the x's or your your regressors or your independent variables now i'm actually moving to look at um a model in which we have we want to model a variable or we want to explain the behavior of a variable that takes only two values zero and one but to uh, put things in context um we're not going to cover every everything here just to want to cover only one case and i'll just but i want you to be aware that this sort of family of models called limited dependent variables so limited dependent variables means that your dependent variable takes certain values okay it's restricted to certain values one of which which we cover today is when it takes only two values zero or one but there are other models where you actually can have more than two values okay but they're still restricted and that's why it's called limited dependent uh, variable so why as a dependent variable the the value for this can range uh, can can actually uh, uh, be restricted to certain values okay in our simplest case that we will cover today is when you y only include two values zero and one so which is the one the first one which we call uh, binary y which means that y takes only two values zero or or one so we're not going to cover the other cases but i just want you to want to make you aware of other cases uh, things that you might uh, uh, um, cover in other econometrics modules uh, uh, next year so as i said we will focus only on a binary response vari dependent variable or binary response variable that means our dependent variable takes only two values yes or no it happened or didn't okay so only two values zero or one okay so there are so many examples that you can actually uh, use this model for so uh whether you, you you're going to work uh by uh, driving or uh using public transportation so you could again use two cases you have zero or one so you can model it zero or one or um being single or or married so again yes or no so it happens or it didn't so you get married or not so this is again so employed and unemployed so you look at two cases here okay remember this is what we're covering in this lecture or in this module okay but then there could be more than two cases okay we we do understand that um going to work it doesn't have to be uh, uh driving or by public transportation might go cycling might go walking running whatever so okay or i might be a free rider just join uh, join a friend or some whatever they, so there's so many cases that we could look at but in this lecture as i said we restrict ourselves to this case where we have only binary y or binary response variable when we have only a, when you have a dependent variable that takes only two values zero or one it's very similar to a, a dummy variable so when we uh, when we define our dummy variables we said it's equal one or zero so and also this sort of model can be estimated by different ways but we also will all will only look at only one case which is when you use or less our uh, uh, lovely magical technique or less okay but this is not brilliant it has so many limitation okay uh, but this is something again we're not going to cover other models which like 
uh, nonlinear models like uh, Propit or Logit. But again, if you do econometrics next year, you will cover this. So you'll learn more about Propit and Logit. So you, you should understand where they come from. Okay, so these are nonlinear uh, 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 estimating this or nonlinear models where you actually try to estimate this not using OLS, the ordinary least square, for the limitation that we will explain now about the limited dependent variable. So in our case here, we just again, we would just look at this very simple uh, model where we have our dependent variable, y, which takes only two values, 0 or 1. And then we have a number of explanatory variables like any model. So the only difference here is that our y or our dependent variable, we know that only takes two values. So it's very restricted to two values, okay? And as I said, this is only one case. Explain there could be more than two values, but at, at the end of the day, we know that it's restricted to uh, certain values. But we look at the simplest form when we have only two val values. So in this case, uh, because uh, y here can take only two values, then our beta, these betas here, remember, that is my, my main concern here. How are we going to interpret that beta? How are we going to explain that beta? So in that case, beta cannot be interpreted as the change in y given a unit change or a unit increase in, in x, okay? Because the expected value of this y given x Okay, so this is the conditional expectation of my dependent variable actually represent that case when uh, y equal one, which could be the probability of this, uh, whatever you're explaining, happen. So the probability of smoking, the probability of going to uh, work driving, or the probability of going, uh, whatever, you try, or being an, an employed, etc. So in that case, all estimation, so if, if I estimate this model using all less, the usual way, the, the, the same way we've been learning so far, order and least squares, this means our parameters here, we actually looking at probabilities. So the probability of being smoking, smoker, okay? So the probability of going work, driving, the probability of, so this is, and that's why it's called a, a linear probability model. Okay, a linear probability model, that means this variable y takes two values and I'm going to estimate this model using O less. That is a linear probability model. Okay, so in that case, beta is here, as I said, so this beta, so the interpretation of this beta, beta 1, beta 2, all these slope coefficients, to interpret any one of these slope coefficients, then you think of the probability of that um, the, the, the thing that you're trying to estimate that or the event that you're trying to make actually happen. So B, probability x, uh, sorry, the probability that y equal 1. So if I define smoker equal 1 or smoking equal 1 uh, if the person is smoker and equal 0 if the person is not, that means the coefficient I'm actually capturing here, this is the probability of uh, the person being smoker. So actually the probability of that thing that uh, that I'm trying to explain happened or take pl took place. So in that case, so it's not beta here is not delta uh, 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 y over delta or dy dx. It's actually d probability that y equal one. So that means the probability that this happened or this event took place. And it's very easy to show why why this is the case. Okay, remember we're looking at the conditional expectation of our dependent variable. That means expected value of y given our x is given the value that we have on the right hand hand side, okay? And that case, if you if you say, okay, if bi is the probability that y i equal one, then <coughs> one minus pi is the probability that y equals zero. So that means why did it happen? So the person is not a smoker, or you're not married, or the person uh, uh, is not an employ is not employed, etc. So that didn't happen. So that means y equals zero. In that case, you could calculate from here. You could find that the probability or y i is the expectation of y i, and that means in that case, one times p i minus. So this is the that means the value when it happened, and this is the value when it doesn't happen. Okay, with its probability, so that means this is zero, and that will end up with 
the case where we have the expected value of y equal the pi, which here is the probability that yi equal 1. So the bottom line here is beta in that case, what, we, what we're looking at here is the probability that y equal 1. Okay? So that's why it's important also to understand how you define y. Okay? What, when you, when it, when it, uh, it's equal 1, when it, when it is equal uh, 0. So in our case, if a person is a smoker, we, we give it 1. If a person is not a smoker, we give it 0. If, let's say, if you want to model uh, going to work by driving or any other form, then again, uh, it's equal 1 if you driving, if the person is driving, otherwise equal, equal 0. Remember, we're looking only at two cases and we restrict this to only two cases here. So in, uh, in our example, so I think it's easier when you look at an example. As I said, we, uh, the example we will look at uh, today is the probability of smoking. And I call that linear probability model. Why? Why do I call it a linear probability model? There are two things. Your dependent variable takes two values, 0 and 1. And I estimate the model using OLS. Okay? In that case, that's a linear probability model. And again, why it's called linear probability model? Because your betas is the probability that y equal 1. Okay? So what the chance is that your y will equal 1 or will happen. What you're trying to model happen. So in this case, let's say we have data about, uh, from a random sample about smoking. Uh, uh, um, the, they're all actually males, so um, we have 1,196 uh, uh, American males, and we define smoker equal 1 if the person is smoker, and 0 if the person is a non-smoker. We also have data about age, so we believe that smoking behavior or Becoming a smoker depends on uh, a number of variables, and these variables we believe could be age. So we measure age in, in years, education, um, income, and the uh, price of cigarettes. Okay, so the price of cigarettes, as like any other uh, product, you, you obviously the, the quantity demand or how much you consume or whether you consume it or not, this will probably depend on, on the price. So the price of cigarettes is actually uh, an important determinant of whether you smoke or not. So let's say, let's just assume that these are the most or the, the important variables in explaining uh, smoking behavior. What do we have here? So this is just a descriptive statistics of our uh, data set. So just to show you, so our smoker uh, variable here Again, the number of observation is 1,196, and the minimum is zero, and the maximum is one. And actually, this is, these are the only two, uh, two values that uh, our variable takes. So it doesn't take any other variable. It, it doesn't take any other values. Only zero uh, if the person is not a smoker, one if the person is a smoker. So what does the mean here mean? So what does this um, um, 0.38 means. What does this mean? Yes. So we have 38% in our sample smokers. Okay? Is that clear? Okay. So, um, <coughs> okay, so how about 41 for age? What does the, when, when the mean age is 41, what does that mean? So an average in your sample that's the, the, the average age in your sample, okay? So education, the average um, education level or number of years of education is 12, 12 years. That's on average, and, and, and so on, okay? So now let's move to the important part here, which is um, looking at how we, how are we going to model this. So now we have a dependent variable that takes only two values, one for smoker, zero for non-smoker, uh, we will apply OLS, so we'll use our OLS, the usual OLS, so you do the same in uh, eViews or whatever software you use for use eViews. Um, but we know that 
our dependent variable takes only two values and that's why this is a linear probability model and now <coughs> we smoking is our or smoke smoker is our dependent variable but on the right hand side we we think age education income uh, price of cigarettes are the um, the important variables that explain smoking behavior we estimated this model sorry oops yeah i just want to just look at the the coefficients so looking at these coefficients now okay so what does what does these coefficient means Do you remember what we said? So what we're actually interested in is how we interpret betas, okay? Or the estimated betas, beta hat. How would we interpret that? In this case, these are not the slope. What are these are? What these are? They are the probability. Great. So the probability of what? Of being a smoker, okay? So that means when you grow older, when you become older one year. Why, why one year? Because age is measured in years. So one, one extra year. So when you become one year older, the probability that you are a smoker will be less. Why less? Because it's negative. The estimated coefficient is negative. By how much? 0 0.007, which, uh, 47, which you, you just can run it, 0 0.005. Okay? So let's again look at the education. So, what does this coefficient mean? So, an extra year of education. Okay, so here education changed by, by how much? By one unit, one year. So, that's, that's how we measure it in year, years of education. So, that means the probability, I'm not talking about uh, unit change or percent change or anything. I'm talking about the probability that you are a smoker will be less by... How much? Exactly, so 0 0.02. So you see here, that's why it's called linear probability model. Okay, well, that's how we interpret betas here. So betas here are the probability of happening, the probability, the event that took place. So in our case here is smoking or becoming a smoker. Okay, so in that case, so an extra year of education, that means, so I, person with one extra year of education, that means they are less likely, less likely to be a smoker by how much, the probability how much here is less by 0 0.02. So what would we expect? Okay, when, when people grow older, maybe they are more concerned about their health. So they might, so the probability they will become a smoker maybe will become less. Um, if people become more educated, maybe they will become more aware of uh, uh, the, the danger of being uh, a smoker, then they are less likely to, to be smokers, okay? So my point here, we actually have some sort of estimation that kind of makes sense with what we would expect anyway. So um, income, well, looking at price first, the price of cigarette, so when price of cigarette increases by whatever we, we, we measure it by dollars or cents, that means the, the again the probability of become a smoker will become less, okay? Because now smoking became more more expensive. So when you look at these coefficients, they are statistically significant, except income. So in, in our case here, income is positive. So it's positive really related to, but it's a very small number if you see that. So it's nearly zero. So in our and it's not significant. If you look at the p-value to 0.53, it's a very large p-value. It's, it's bigger than, it's larger than 10%, uh, uh, 5% or 1%, so it's larger than 10%. So that means it's not statistically significant. And even when you look at the magnitude, how much that coefficient is, it's very small. It's nearly, uh, it's, it's almost zero, okay? But in general, when we look at other coefficients, at least, uh, the all significant, statistically significant, at least at 10%. Because when you look at the price of cigarettes, it's, it's, uh, it's significant at 10%, not at 5% level, because it's 0.7. So p-value here, this p-value is 0.7, so it's, it's, it's greater than 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.
but we could accept it as <coughs> statistically significant as 10%. Okay? So my point that our estimation kind of makes sense in terms of what we expect uh, with the sign. So the sign means, again, if we have negative sign, that means you are less likely. If you have positive sign, that means you are more likely, and this is the probability or how much you, um, the probability will change uh, for uh, uh, the way we interpret these, these coefficients. So is that clear? So again, just before we move to the next point, just when we talk about the limitation of this sort of models, um, what we looked at so far, okay, so we understand that this dummy variable or this variable or qualitative information could be modeled part of X, it you know, could be included as one of the X in my model, or the second part of the lecture we're talking about when we have these sort of uh, 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 binary response uh, 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 variables, but we understand that this is only one case because you could have Y that takes more than two va uh, values. But we will focus only, we focused only on in one case, which is when Y takes two values, one and zero. Um, and we also said we're going to submit this model using OLS, so what we learned so far. And for that reason, what we we estimating here is the linear probability model, or LPM, what I call LPM, so linear probability model. And again, the way we interpret these coefficients, that's, that's the takeaway message here. So the way we interpret this coefficient is the probability. So we're looking at the probability of happening or of, of y equal 1. Okay. So when we look at this example here, so if you grow older by one year or like somebody who's older by one year, then they are less likely to, less likely again that because of the sign, because we have a negative sign for the estimated coefficient for age, that means it's less likely to, to become or to, to be a smoker by uh, 0 0.005 if you round it up. Um, for like somebody who is um, an extra year of education, that means he will be, or he will, she will be uh, li uh, less likely, again, because this sign is negative, uh, less likely to be a smoker, be, be, b and this is how much less likely they will be, which is 0 0.02. Uh, uh, again, this is the probability. So, and, and so on. So, when we, we still can look at these the same way, the p value, interpret the p value in the same way, whether this estimated coefficient is statistically significant or not, or whether it is statistically different from zero or not. So, it's the same way with. Uh, so everything is ex pretty much the same what you did before, it's just the way we interpret that beta and the way we call and, and what we call that model. So that model is called linear probability model and as I said before, there are so many limitations for this model and that's why most people will take it only as a starting point and always will go, um, or many people will compare, usually people will compare the results from linear probability model to another nonlinear model like Probit or Logit, but these two models will not cover in this, uh, in this module and you might cover next year if you, if you do econometrics again. So uh, these are just some comments. As I said, these are the, exactly the comments we discussed now. So all variable except income are individually statistically significant at the 10% level. Age, education, price have negative impact on smoking as expected. As you said, where an older person may be uh, more concerned about their, their health or more educated person are more concerned about their health. And also it makes sense when, when the price is higher that you will, um, you might not be, um, the chances that or the probability you'll be a smoker would be less. And that's something, w w that's what we would expect. And as I said, you would interpret other, co other stuff like the F statistic the same way, uh, like the way you would interpret it in, in any other uh, linear model. So anyway, so these are the, <coughs> the, the, the results and these are the, again, um, these are what we said about uh, the estimated uh, coefficient and the, the, the probability of being smoker. And as I said, when uh, an older person might be uh, kind of more concerned about the health or uh, education, again, might, uh, might be um, reduce the probability that a person will become a smoker, the same thing. So when you look at R square, is is very low, but it's not important. Why is it not important? When you go uh, when you go back to look at what R square was, it was here at point zero three eight eight. It's 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 very it's small, but it's not again. It doesn't really uh, it doesn't really matter. Why? Because 
when you look at R square, remember how we define R square? It tell us like again, it tell us about how much of the variation of your dependent variable that is explained by your point, uh, by your model. Okay, meaning by your x's together or collectively. In our case here, our y doesn't really have this sort of variation because it only has two values, only zero and one. Okay, so that's why we're not really concerned about um, about uh, the value of R square in this sort of models. Okay, with with linear probability model, so it shouldn't be uh, R square is not really important again because R square measure or give you like some indication about how much of the variation of your uh, y that explained by your model, by your x's. But when you look at the variation of our, our y here, we know that our y actually doesn't have this sort of variation. It only take only two, more, two values, only zero and one. Okay? So, so that's why r square is not really something that we should uh, worry too much about. Okay. Any questions? Do you remember what I said in the beginning? Linear probability model has so many limitations, or a number of limitations, and that's why. Um, I mean, there are so uh, there are so many people out there that are very uh, like big fans of linear probability model. I think this is much better than other models, probit or logit. But this is fine, okay? So I'm not taking you to that debate now. I'm not taking you to which one is better than the other. But at least you should know the limitation of the linear probability model. So, as we explained, why is it linear probability model? We have our dependent variable, take two values, and we estimate this using OLS, you see? Remember these two. So, when your dependent variable takes only two values, so it's restricted only to two values, zero and one, and you estimate the model using OLS, that produce uh, what we call a linear probability model. And we saw how we explain or interpret the, the estimated coefficient. Now, what remains to us now for us is to, to look at the limitation. So, uh, in, in, when, you, when you talk about limitation, the model here, the linear probability model, uh, assume that probability of smoking moves linearly with the value of x. So, no matter how small or large that value is, so it doesn't matter really. Um, when you look at age, so it doesn't matter really is that we're looking at the range from the change from. 20 to 21 or 40 to 45, uh, so it doesn't really matter where you are. But when you look at the nonlinear models, it actually it, it actually consider this sort of uh, uh, difference. So they, the probability is not going to change. Um, the, uh, it doesn't really depend on the value of x at all. So it, it, it actually changed linearly with, with the value of x. So that means a person with, um, like a, a younger person, 20s or in their 20s, uh, how much that the smoking probability will change compared to someone with their 40s. Again, that will change linearly as you go, uh, as you go older. So it's not going to be any different. So it doesn't depend really or no matter how, how large your value of X or your, your, your regressor is. Also, which is actually more important as well, it was very important or equally important, that when we talk about probability, we understand that probability takes value from zero to one, okay? So it could be anywhere between zero or one. So it's not really acceptable and it's not meaningful and you cannot explain it if the probability become greater than one. And with the linear probability model, there's nothing to guarantee that, okay? So there's nothing to guarantee with OLS estimation that what we would have is actually, well, it happened in our case was between zero and one, and we didn't look at any extreme values on, uh, in our model, we're actually looking at on, on average. But maybe even in our data or in our sample, there might be some cases where when you uh, try to calculate the probability of that person or that individual, like an extreme case, uh, whether they are smoker or not, then you might end up with a probability that actually greater than than one, which doesn't make sense, which actually is not meaningful, something that you cannot really explain or interpret. So my point here, the probability value must be between zero and one. But with all this, there's nothing to guarantee this will happen. Okay? And this is one of, uh, this is another limitation of uh, linear probability model. Another limitation related to the error term is usually not uh, normally distributed. Why? because we understand that 
by construction, this model, y equals 0 or 1. So it doesn't have the sort of normal distribution. And also the errors uh, from a linear probability model are likely to be uh, heteroscedastic. Um, I know heteroscedasticity is something we'll talk about next uh, lecture, but again, uh, we defined this before. We said homoscedastic errors means uh, an error term that has uh, constant variance. We call that sigma squared. But if it is not, uh, that, if that's not the case, that is called heteroscedastic errors. And this is something that is likely to happen with linear probability model. And again, the implication or the consequences of that, how this affects our uh, OLS estimation, uh, this is something we'll talk about next lecture about how heter why heteroscedasticity is a problem and what is the effect or the consequences of heteroscedasticity in our estimation. But in general, this is one of the limitations, as we said, uh, of the linear probability model. So one, it assumes the probability uh, of your dependent variable move linearly with the value of x, so it doesn't really matter uh, how small or large that value is. The probability, uh, we know that the probability must have or must be between 0 and 1, but with all this estimation, there's nothing to guarantee this. So again, this is another limitation of our model. Uh, their term is not normally distributed because our dependent variable take only two values, so 0 and 1. And also their term is likely to be heteroscedastic. And again, this is one of the problems with, uh, with this with, uh, that causes issues with um, OLS estimation. It doesn't make it blue. Remember, we want all these, all these conditions or all these assumptions to be true. Remember, from A1 to A7, okay? If these are true, then our OLS is blue, and this is something desirable, something we really would like to see or to have in our OLS estimation. But now, since that the, hit, um, the errors are not homoscedastic, they are heteroscedastic, that means they, have, they don't have a constant variance. That will lead to some issues with our um, OLS. And in particular, they will be no longer blue. They're not going to be the best. They're not going to be blue anymore. Okay, so one of the assumptions that we made about the OLS isn't true, so that means our, our, um, our estimator is not blue. It's not what we would like to have. Anyway, so these are the limitations. So just me, let me just sum up this uh, part of the lecture. So what we talked about so far, we said, okay, we want to model qualitative information as part of the dependent variable or model as the dependent variable, so in the, in the left-hand side. We said there, would, there could be many cases or cases where we have y restricted, the value that y takes restricted to uh, uh, certain values. But the simplest way or the simplest form of, it, of this is when your y takes only two values. In our case here, we, okay, we assume this is like um, a binary uh, response model, meaning or a, bi a binary response dependent variable means that it takes only two values, zero or one. So one if it happened, zero if it didn't happen. One if yes, no, that means zero. So if you are a smoker, equal one. If, you, if you're not a smoker, equal, equal zero. So what we want to understand or what we want to learn here, if we interpret this model using OLS, then we actually uh, producing a linear probability model. And it is probability because what we're looking at, the betas here, we're looking at probability. We're not looking at the slope, the change against the change. So we're not looking at the change in x against the change in y because in that case, we know that y actually, it's either yes or no, it happens or not. Okay? So that's why it's, uh, so we, the, the way we interpret this uh, is important. And then we said, okay, so this is the linear model, but we could have used uh, a nonlinear model to submit this model, which one of, you could use profit or logit, but again, we said this is something we're not going to cover in this uh, module. And finally, we talked about the limitations, the limitations of a uh, uh, linear probability model, and this is something that you need to be aware of, even if you're not going to, to study other, like the profit or the logit model, you still need to, to learn or to understand uh, these uh, limitations. Um, this, the, the reading for this, uh, this lecture is chapter two in Waldridge textbook. Next lecture, we'll talk about multicollinearity and heteroscedasticity. Before you go, do you have any questions? Any questions? Do you remember what we talked about today? Modeling qualitative information. So we talked about 
when we model qualitative information as the regressor, one of the regressors we talk about when, when it is on the right hand side, and then we move to talk about the case when it is in the left hand side. I will upload this in Hanomics. Please listen to the lecture um, on Hanomics. And if you have any questions, please, please let me know. Thank you.